I'm, I am quite overwhelmed today. So many friends have gathered to organize this conference, to be here in the room in St. John's College, to listen in online. I have to mention uh, just a, a few words of thanks. First of all, to Diana, Larry, and Tim Cheek for their opening comments here in St. John's. Um, particularly to Chen Jinhua for organizing this conference, for even thinking that it was worth having a conference uh, that responded to the work that I've done in the history of Buddhism. Um, uh, to Li Tiangang, my old friend Li Tiangang, who has uh, brought the resources of Fudan into this conference. I'm, I'm delighted uh, to see him here today. Um, I also want to mention uh, Zhang De Wei, who was my graduate stu student here at UBC, and I followed his work very closely, and he's been a He's been a wonderful support for this conference. And in fact, it was he and I through discussion that led to the uh, decision that we'd work on local religion or religion and local society, that that would be the theme that would draw us together. And um, fin my final expression of gratitude is for everybody who is doing this online. It's been two and a half years of talking to each other online. It's very difficult. All of us have had to teach and speak online, and I appreciate your patience and your willingness to do this. And um, I hope that the days when this can change will be coming along soon. So the theme of the, the, the conference uh, that has been organized is religions and local society. And that theme got me thinking about a little bit about my own work. I'll, I'll explain what this uh, photograph is um, a little bit later in my talk. Um, and so this is, I've put together a talk that tries to think about the problem of local Buddhism, and you could apply this to local religion in general. Where do we find religion when it is local? And so I've, I've, I'm, I'll, I'll try not to take too long on this. My, my, my remarks are posted on the conference website, but I want to first talk about the problem of local and translocal, then the problem of outsider and insider, and then I've got three examples to give you where I'm going to try and test out some of these problems, some of these ideas about what local religion not, might be. And I've chosen the three Wu's, Wu Tai Shan, Wu Dang Shan, and Wu Shan. And I'll explain the choice uh, a little bit later. And then finally, I'm going to sum up with some thoughts on Buddhism and localism. The reason that I've gotten thinking about this is that, that um, as you all know, my work has been on a kind of socioeconomic analysis of Buddhism. And if you're going to look at the socioeconomy of an institution, it has to be locally embedded. It has to happen somewhere. It just doesn't happen sort of in, in some abstract translocal space. But it's got me thinking that to pursue my research that I've done in the past on Buddhism and local society, I wonder whether I've in fact captured what the local experience of Buddhism is, because my sources have by and large been written by elites whose eye is often to the translocal aspect of religion rather than to the local aspect of religion. Um, so my, this, this paper that I've written, and I'm, thank you, uh, Doe and Jinhua for, for for allowing me to present a paper at this conference. Um, my paper is an attempt to rethink localism and ask where can we find it. So my, um, my starting point uh, was to look at Buddhist institutions in local settings in the Ming Dynasty. And I think I was drawn to that because as a student of Chinese studies, when I was an undergraduate, my first interest in China was in Chinese Buddhism. This is where my interest in China began. And uh, for me, Buddhism was a translocal phenomenon. I grew up in Toronto, Canada. There was some Buddhism there, mostly Japanese Buddhism. There wasn't much Chinese Buddhism in Toronto back in the 1960s and 70s. So for me, Buddhism was a kind of translocal thing rather than a local experience. Although at one point I did become the student of a Canadian Japanese Buddhist monk uh, to learn something of Buddhist practice from, from her. She was a nun, excuse me. Um, 
Now, the, the, this distinction between translocal and local is very much like an old distinction we used to make in, in religious studies between um, popular religion and elite religion. And to some extent, it's, this, it's a similar kind of distinction, but it's also a little bit different because even elites have local experiences and even local people may tap into elite culture. Um, and why does localism matter? I think because for most people, religion is a local experience. You go to a temple, you go to a shrine, you go to a church, you engage in a community of, of, of co-religionists. That's how you understand uh, what, what religion is. You learn it locally. And I was sort of inspired by um, Peter Bowles' most recent book called Localizing Learning. He's looking at Neo-Confucianism in the Northern Zhejiang. And he points out that Neo-Confucianism, the history of Neo-Confucianism was shaped by local opposition to national trends. So the local, in Neo-Confucianism, the local comes up to reshape what the national ideas are. And he also points out that Neo-Confucians live in a local culture. You have your neighbors, you have your discussions with, with other people, you experience your life locally. And the ideas that you, you, you generate maybe come down from a sort of translocal um, uh, framework, but, but you experience them locally. And, and I think maybe one of the problems of the study of Chinese Buddhism is that we, we've left out the local too much. So what I'm going to try and do in this talk is think about, uh, think about how we can, how to think about local Buddhism but also where to find it. I mean, what is local? Is a village local? How many Chinese live in villages anymore? A minority, probably. Is it your neighborhood? How big is your neighborhood? Is it, does it go all the way out to your county? Well, in the Ming dynasty, that was my fallback. I thought of the county as the unit of the local, but a county could have 100,000 people in it. 100,000 people is not local. Um, then there's the question of who is local? Uh, a farmer who doesn't go anywhere except to market, his experience is local. How about a member of the gentry, a member of the elite who goes off to Beijing, who holds posts around the country? Where is that person's relationship to the local? Um, and then what sites are local? You may have a beautiful monastery sitting on a lovely mountain. Does that make it local to that place? Or does it have no local entity whatsoever? Now, this may seem... Um, I don't know, I hope this doesn't seem too abstract and I'm going to get concrete about it in a moment. But the challenge is, is to think about what is, oh, excuse me, I'm not following along on, the, on my slides. I pulled this slide from um, a study by Willem Grothers uh, and uh, Deng Jinping, who will speak in the first panel in this conference, uh, deals with Grothers. And I just pulled this, this photograph out of one of his research studies. It's a little Guan Di Miao up there off to the east of Datong in some place that none of us has ever been. And there's a, a, a group of the local people came out for the photograph. They're sitting around, their picture is taken. Is this the local? I don't know. Grotus was very interested in finding the local and almost, you almost have to find it anthropologically, but I'm a historian and I'm trying to find the local uh, historically. All right, so let me now move to the question of outsider versus insider perspective. All of us are outsiders to Ming Buddhism, if we study Ming Buddhism. There is no insider left, they're all dead. And even Chinese who like to think of Ming Buddhism as their Buddhism, that's five centuries ago. It's not your local Buddhism anymore. It's a translocal idea that has replaced the religious experience. So. Um, and I, I began to sort of feel that my source, I tried to find local sources in my work. Often it's a local gazetteer. Um, I also use pilgrimage guides because a pilgrim has to be somewhere. A pilgrim has to walk along the path and cross the river and get to the site. And I thought that maybe that was one way that we can get at local Buddhism. And so in fact, um, what I'm gonna do in this talk, I'm gonna take three sites out of this pilgrim's handbook, Sanshui Jujin. Uh, initially published in 1827. No copies of that edition exist. We only have the 1876 edition. This is from the Fusunyan Library, the, the reproduction. 
there was a copy of this in the Harvard Library when I was a graduate student. And I just pulled it off the shelf, devoured it, transcribed the entire book, got really interested in pilgrimage, and then decided I didn't yet have anything to say about it. So this is my chance to think about, about this pilgrim's guide. The other source that I, I used for local studies were local gazetteers. And so the three sources I'm gonna talk about today all have a local or a temple or a mountain gazetteer. And I mean, there's maybe I'm trying to overstate the difference between what is what is what the insider experiences and what the outsider experiences, but a pilgrim is an outsider. A pilgrim comes into the place, sees the place, experiences the place, and then leaves it. Not unlike a tourist who, a tourist who goes to Wutaishan looks around, sees the five platforms, visits the, the Manjushri temple, and then takes some selfies and leaves. That's not local Buddhism, that's tourist Buddhism. And I, I don't want us as historians to be tourists in the past. I want us to engage with their experience as much as we can of what it was like to be a Buddhist at Wutaishan. So, um, uh, now, the Sanskrit tradition was written for monks. It wasn't written for lay people. It was to turn pilgrimage into a form of training. And it's an excellent guide to, for that purpose. But a lot of lay people used Sanskrit tradition as well because it told them, well, you take this road for five li and then you cross the bridge here and then you go left at the next fork in the road. It's a very practical guide of how to get to a place. So the three places I've chosen Wutaishan, Wudangshan, and Wushan. Um, I chose them somewhat at random, but I also chose them because there was a local monastic gazetteer. So in fact, I'm not going to talk about Wudangshan in Northern Hubei very much. Instead, I'm going to talk about Xiangyan Monastery, and I'll explain that in a minute, which is on the road to Wudangshan. But I wanna look at these three places and very briefly ask, what can we find that is local? To these places and how does that help us understand why they were important in Chinese Buddhism. So ah the for some reason the computer has turned my slides sideways and the problem with this is that um, the things that I've marked are not the things that I wanted you to pay attention to. Let me see what goes on next. Oh well. Um, Never mind. We'll just move on. Um, so, Wu Taishan, the monast uh, Buddhist uh, monastic and cult center in Shanxi Province, to the west of Beijing, was a center for the the uh, for the worship of Manjusri. And here is uh, Manjusri Bodhisattva here himself. It's the first page in the local gazetteer for Wu Taishan. Um, it's a very important site for, uh, for Ruhai, who is the, the, the author of Tsan Shui Jijin. Uh, he makes it the destination of his very first route, how to get from Beijing to Wutaishan, and then he uses it for, for the departure point for route four and route five. So it's, it's important in the, in the pilgrim's guide. And I thought, okay, let's see, what, let's see how the two report it. Well, um, Sanshui Zhijin doesn't tell us very much about, uh, it tells us what the major sites are. And if, if this slide hadn't got messed up, it would have shown you that the Manjushri, uh, the Manjushri temple is the most important point. So you go to the central Manjushri temple, and then he describes how to get out and around the five different terraces to appreciate the area. Uh, but that's all he says. He doesn't say much about its significance, its religious significance, if you like. Now, the Qingyang Shanzhi, which is the, the temple gazetteer for Wu Taishan, is very much more specific about the religious importance of Manjushri. And it was for this reason that uh, inner Asians, Tibetans, Mongols, and later, of course, Manchus uh, venerated Wu Taishan because Manjushri was for them the most important. Uh, object of veneration. So um, this, this uh, list of 10, it's a list of 10 topics in the gazetteer. It doesn't quite line up with the Jan very well, but if you look at the topics, uh, for those of you who have Chinese, 
you'll notice that there's a great emphasis put on well, imperial patronage, the patronage of famous people, of powerful officials, famous monks, famous Buddhist monasteries. The only place you find anything local is in section nine, the yi zhong gan tong. So the, the, the experiences, the religious experiences that people have had when they go to the mountain. And you can be a famous official and never have a religious experience in the Taishan. So um, I went through this, this jan, and there are seven stories from the Ming Dynasty. And interestingly, they're all from the North China, people from the North China Plain. So Chen Ding, uh, Yongping, Beijing, uh, two from Beijing, one from Zhen, uh, another one from Chen Ding, Hejian. They're all from people on the North China Plain, which gives me the sense that this was a kind of cult center for North China Plain people. There was one story about a woman from Suzhou, but she's the only non-North China Plain person who shows up having a miraculous experience, which to me suggests what the, the catchment area for this institution was. Not local at all. In fact, it was a regional catchment area. I was only able to find one story about a local person. And this is, uh, Wu Taishan has five Thai. And the, there was a person from Bei Thai who gets, he gets recorded here because he stole some money. He's struck by lightning. And when he comes to, he admits his sin. And um, Manjusri clearly is the one who struck him with lightning. And so that gets included in the gazetteer. This is the only local voice that I've been able to find in this gazetteer. And I quite like the idea that it's some guy who just stole some money. Um, clearly, this is part of his, his local religious space. That said, there are a couple more stories when you read the stories of officials, a couple of stories about deforestation. The local people loved Wu Taishan because you could go up there and cut trees and drag them out and sell them for a lot of money. And there was also a reference to local landowners taking advantage of imperial tax breaks in order to get the taxes on their agricultural land exempted. So from the, if you want to see what's the local perspective in this gazetteer, the local perspective is what money can I make out of this site? Very little sense that there is any religious, local religious community. However, and I'll stop my, my comments on Wu Taishan with this next page. At the end of many chapters of the Qingyang Changzhi, there's a list of people who donated to the publication. And if you'll notice, on this page, with I think only one exception, they're all women. And there's page after page of female donors listed in this gazetteer. Who are these women? Where are they from? Are they local? What is their local? Are they from all over the North China Plain? Or are they from like Eastern Shanxi? And this to me would be the next, uh, if I were gonna do a project on Wu Taishan, it would be to find these women. And that I think would tell us about the community, the religious community that may have been there despite all of this other stuff going on. This imperial gifts from the emperors and local thieves that there is in fact a local religious community and it would be nice to be able to find them. All right, I'm now going to move to Wudangshan. And as I said, not all the way to Wudangshan, I'm actually going to go to a monastery and I've marked it here, uh, Xiangyan Si. It's in a little county, I shouldn't call it little, but I'd never heard of it before, called Xichuan. It's in Western Henan and um, uh, to get there, you take Route 5 from Wu Taishan down to the Yellow River, and then you pick up Route 9, and that gets you from the Yellow River down to Wu Dangshan. And there's an alternate route that you can take. You duck into Western Henan, you come out again, and in Western Henan, you go to Xiangyan Si. So I got curious about this and discovered that there is a very rare monastic gazetteer of Xiangyan Si. Um, 
Uh, this is the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the author's uh, preface dated 1660, if I remember correctly. This is the, the abbot. Um, Xiang Yan Si was destroyed at the end of the Ming. It's rebuilt in the late 1650s. Uh, and they, they edited a local gazetteer to describe um, the history of Xiang Yan Si. Well, Xiang Yan Si is just nobody's ever heard of Xiang Yan Si, unless you were an imperial envoy coming from Beijing to Wudangshan, as happened starting in the Yongle period. Uh, if you were an imperial envoy, you always stopped at Xiang Yan Si. But if you weren't an imperial envoy going to Wudangshan, you'd never go to Xiang Yan Si. It's an entirely local monastery. However, if you look, it's a very short gazetteer. There's a Zhuang Shang and a Zhuang Xia, as you can see on the, on the left here. What the, what the uh, uh, Chaogu, the abbot Chaogu tries to do is establish Xiangyan as something that's really important to the imperial project. He wants to sort of uh, catch a ride with the imperial monastic and temple patronage. And um, the most important story he can tell us is the Chenghua emperor uh, who died in 1487. And this is an edict he issued uh, three months before he died, protecting Xiang Yan Si against local people. And he, where does he, oh, here it is. Uh, uh, Guan Yuan, so officials, those are the officials that are probably going to Wudang Chan, but also Jun Min Ren Dong, so soldiers, local people. It's, a, it's, a, it's an edict of protection because um, Xiang Yan Monastery was rebuilt by an imperial kinsman early in the 15th century with leftover construction materials from Wudang Shan. And whether they were left over or he siphoned them off, whatever, he rebuilt, uh, uh, this prince rebuilt uh, Xiang Yan Monastery. And then what did the locals do? Well, they started stealing all the building materials. And so Cheng Hua said, no, 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 I'm a firm believer in Buddhism. You must respect this monastery. And uh, so that's the theme of Zhuan One. The theme of Zhuan Two is the Xia Si. So there, there is, there's, Xiang Yan Monastery is up in a hill. And there's a Xia Si down by the route. So if you're an imperial envoy coming from Beijing, you stop at the Xia Si. And there you can get tea, you can get food, uh, you can get lodging. It basically services the imperial conduit between Beijing and Wudangshan. And uh, yeah, the, 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 the Chao Li, the, the, those who are going to do, to do veneration at the local, uh, at, at Wudangshan. So the only reason uh, this monastery gets any importance, any notice, is because it's because of support coming from elsewhere. And in fact, the, 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 county, the county magistrate, who also writes a preface, points out that you can't maintain a monastery. It's too difficult to maintain a monastery using a full county's resources, or even a xiang, a canton, a, which is the subunit of the county. It's not, a, a local county can't support a local monastery on this scale. So we need donations, we need support. Um, which, is an, which I think points up the contradiction that arises for an institution like this. It needs outside support, but once it needs that outside support, it perhaps is cut loose from the local religious reality, but perhaps not. And in fact, that's what I'm interested in sort of puzzling through. How do local people then exploit what's going on at this translocal level for their institution? And I went online just to see what's Xiang Yan Monastery like? I'd never heard of it. I'd never been there. And the, here's the Xia Si. This is the local, this is the, 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 the version of Xiangyan Monastery that's down on the route from Beijing to Wudangshan. And it's now looking quite prosperous. Um, uh, who's funding it? Uh, why are they funding it? I mean, and th this then leads to the puzzle of local Buddhism today. How local is this? Is it local at all? Perhaps it is, perhaps it isn't. There's a research topic for somebody. Okay, my third example is, uh, uh, is 
called the Wushan, the Five Hills outside of Nantong on the northern, uh, the northern coast of the Yangtze River estuary. Uh, the most important of these was Langshan Wolf Mountain, uh, or really Wolf Hill. These are small hills, these are not mountains. And this was a site that Ruhai, the, uh, the, the, the compiler of Sensei Zhu Jin, he, he, he sent pilgrims to it through two different routes. This is in the second half of the book, route five and route six, as you'll see here on the slide. It's if you number them consecutively, route 34 and route 35. So he uses two routes and the pilgrim ends up at Langshan. And why? Well, um, for him, let me just see. Yes, for him, it's because this is the Dharma place of Mahasthama, uh, uh, the, the Dasham Pusa. And uh, everybody knows about Amitabha and uh, who sits on the left side of Amitabha? Uh, it escapes me, but Mahasthama sits on the right hand side of Amitabha. And therefore, for Amitabha the, the, the devotees, this is an important site to go to. However, when you get there, there's not much to see in the way of Buddhism. And you'll see he talks about the Dashong Pusa, he, he refers to that twice, the Dashi Ji Pusa, which is another name uh, for, the same, for the same Bodhisattva. And curiously, he can't name a single religious institution there. The main monastery is Guangzhou Si, but even Ruhai doesn't, doesn't even know the name of the local monastery. But he, this, for, him, for him, the, the veneration of Mahasthama is, is very important. So he, he, he takes you there twice in the Pilgrim's Guide. And in fact, on this page, he gives you this, your own little guide to the five hills um, while you're there. So, He's interested in it, but where? what's the local? Well, uh, the Wushan have a gazetteer from the 18th century. And this is a picture of the five hills. Uh, Langshan is the one right in the center of the picture. And then there are the other four smaller hills around it. Um, there is nothing in the illustrations of the gazetteer that suggests much in the way of Buddhism. Um, there is, this is the, this is the, uh, supposed to be the illustration of Langshan. And you'll see there is a monastic complex down there on the lower right hand side, but it doesn't have a label. Nobody's naming this place. And in fact, well, it's difficult. Uh, I haven't done the local research to know whether Guangzhou Si was even in operation. So, there is a local monastic gazetteer, doesn't really pay attention to Buddhism, but the, the really hot document in this gazetteer, for those of you who like local Ming Buddhism, is this text by Dong Qi Chang, the great late Ming artist and calligrapher. And he writes this long text, it goes on for about four or five pages, this long text about uh, a miracle that happens on Junshan, Army Hill, which is a different one than Longshan, and the setting up of a local monastic complex. And he says, uh, do I, I don't have the, the text quite in front of me, but he says, oh yeah, Zhu Xiang Shen Shi Min. So the various, the, the gentry and the ordinary people of the various cantons in the region in this region of Ruha County, that they, um, uh, sorry, Rugao County, that they stepped forward and they helped to create um, this monastery. And the monastery is, goes by, oh, it's the Putua Biyan. Uh, it's the uh, Putaraka sort of sub monastery. So this all happens in, what about 1628? I think Dong Qi Chang wrote this about 1630. He's celebrating, if you like, the, he, he's Buddhicizing the Wushan. He's turning it into a Buddhist site. And he's got local people that are supporting the monastery. But then when you go, there's Junshan. I'm, I'm taking you back to the initial illustration. Junshan is the, is the small hill down at the front on the right. But when you go to the illustration of Junshan, there's nothing, there's no, there's no monastery there. There is a thing called the Putoyen, the, the, uh, the Potoraka cliff, 
but it seems to be gone too. So what I'm doing is I'm presenting you with my, with the sort of puzzles that have struck me. When I use, I go to local gazetteers, I look at the, um, the, the pilgrim text and I try to understand what is the nature of local Buddhism? Well, so here are my, my concluding remarks on Buddhism and localism. The three sites I've chosen are similar but different. Uh, they're similar in the fact, in, in the sense that they feature in the Pilgrim's Guide. Utai Shan, of course, was nationally known. It was imperially patronized. It was prominent throughout the North China uh, macro region. Wushan was really only regionally known. It didn't have any imperial patronage, but it was known sort of that area north of the Yangtze River, it was known. Um, Xiangyan Monastery was unheard of, except that it, it sort of grabbed the coattails of Wudangshan and um, was able to benefit because of that. However, both sets tell me very little about local direction or local engagement, local involvement in these sites. And it, when it appears, it appears in the, deeply in the shadow of patronage coming from higher up, sort of from the regional elite, from the national elite, from the palace. Um, each site undoubtedly hosted some form of local Buddhist practice. It would be amazing if it didn't, even if you as a poor peasant wanted to go into some one of the big monasteries at Wutai Shan, maybe they wouldn't even let you in, but you'd probably go up to the gate and bow and burn incense because the Manjusri has been brought to Wutai Shan. This should be important to you. But finding the record of what this, of what this involvement was is very difficult. Um, it doesn't mean, and, and I'm not trying to argue that if, if you're local, you're not connected to sign of the translocal world of Buddhism. You are, it may be the one way in which you connect outside your own, your own society. So religion is both a highly local form of practice with the capacity to be translocal, if you could imagine it, or you can afford it, or you, your ability to experience it by leaving your own uh, your own area. So that the idea that the Buddha was local uh, is pretty a, a pretty clear cognitive component of local religious thinking. The idea that the Buddha was everywhere is a bit harder to manage if you're just a local peasant. Uh, this is what monks had to do though. Monks had to learn. In fact, they had to go out on pilgrimage because they had to learn that Buddha wasn't just at their local temple but it was at all these temples and you had to travel to all these temples in order to experience Buddhism. So um, it can be argued that by starting from my pilgrimage manual, I've prejudiced the search for local Buddhism because I'm really talking about tourist Buddhism. And this, this compromises the chance to get at local Buddhism. But I like to think that the pilgrimage manual isn't a barrier to the task of identifying local Buddhism. The next step in that process would be to actually go through, as I did as a graduate student, go through the pilgrimage manual, manual and note all the little temples along the way. Because to get you from Beijing to Wudaishan, you go to this little temple and you go to that little shrine, then you go to that little temple and that little shrine, and eventually you end up at Wudaishan. So those are the places that really intrigue me. And those are the places, of course, about which he has almost nothing to say. And yet it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fairly comprehensive record of, the, of local religious life throughout China in the early 19th century. Um, it doesn't tell us much about it, but we know it's there. And the reason why I think this is important, uh, why, we does, why we need to pay attention to local Buddhism is that we need to come closer to the communities of practice that kept Buddhism meaningful as a religion in China. If we spend too much time talking about the great abbots, the great Buddhist theorists, I mean, this is all, this is all part of the study of Chinese Buddhism. But I think to really understand Chinese Buddhism as a living institution, 
and to understand why Buddhist institutions mattered in local society, we've got to get down there into local society. It's just that we need to figure out how to get there. If you're an anthropologist, of course, in 2022, you can go and ask questions. If you're a historian, well, all we can do is keep digging around, looking for texts, looking for sort of side glances into these local Buddhist communities. And I think we have a lot more to learn. So that's not a very stunning conclusion to my research paper, but it's the best I can do at this moment. And I wanna thank you all for giving me the chance to present these thoughts to you today. <laughs>